Okay, so hi guys. Uh, my name is Ben Lazher. I'm a third year medical student, and today uh, we're going to have uh, a PAL session about hemoglobin electrophoresis and uh, hemoglobinopathies. Um, this presentation is inspired by Dr. Rehan's, uh PowerPoint, so I just need to mention that. So before we start with anything, I think it's really um, uh, appropriate that we start by introducing hemoglobin. What is hemoglobin in the first place? So hemoglobin is a chemical structure that is found in red blood cells, okay? And its role is to carry oxygen from your cardiovascular system or from the lungs to your target uh, organs, whether that was your GI, your uh, urinary system, your muscles, your bones, every single cell in your body needs oxygen. So hemoglobin from the role is an important, very, very important structure or chemical structure in your body. So uh, as you can see, this is the structure of hemoglobin. It has two alpha chains and two beta chains. Okay, and we're going to get more in detail about the types of uh, hemoglobin and everything. So uh, where do we get hemoglobin from? We get it from two chromosomes, chromosome 11 and chromosome 16. So chromosome 11 has the uh, beta globin genes. Okay, we all know that uh, chromosomes have two alleles. Okay, and beta globin gene is found on both alleles. Only two genes, one gene in one allele and the other gene is on the other allele. So in total, we have two beta uh, globin genes. Uh, uh, for the alpha, on the other hand, it's found on chromosome 16. Okay. Uh, chromosome 16, as we said, every chromosome has two alleles. Each allele of chromosome 16 has two alpha genes. So in total, we have four alpha genes. All right. So uh, the beta globin gene, one is from the father and one is from the mother, and the alpha globin gene, two from the mother and two from the father. Okay, so uh, the types of hemoglobin that are found in a normal healthy adult are mostly hemoglobin A. This is the structure of hemoglobin A. You have two alpha chains and two beta chains. Uh, all types of hemoglobin have a standard um, chain, which is alpha. Alpha does not change, okay? It either gets less or it's just normal. So the, the thing that changes is the beta chain. It can be beta, could be gamma, could be delta. So um, we have two alpha and two beta chains for hemoglobin A, which is the majority of hemoglobin types that you have. Uh, uh, hemoglobin F stands for hemoglobin fetal or fetal hemoglobin. It's found in, uh, in, in healthy adults in less than 1%, 1% or less, okay? And this uh, type of hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen, and it is found, as the name suggests, in uh, babies, okay? Uh, the last part or the last type of hemoglobin is hemoglobin A2, okay? It should be found in the normal human body or a normal uh, adult body in less than 3.5%. Uh, and it has two alpha chains, of course, and two delta chains. So you have to remember these percentages. Dr. Raihan really likes to ask about these percentages. And if the percentage changes, it goes higher or lower, that would probably indicate a problem or a disease that manifested in that patient. So we have to remember the normal percentages or the normal ranges before you get to recognize the abnormal. Okay, so uh, hemoglobin uh, abnormalities. You have structural and quantitative. Structural, that means there is a problem with the formation and the structure of the red blood cells. Quantitative means there is a problem in the number that is produ produced by the body, okay? An example that we're going to take today for, for structural hemoglobin abnormalities is sickle cell, anemia, sickle cell anemia. For quantitative, we have uh, thalassemia, okay? Okay. Um, Noor said, is hemoglobin A2 found in normal adults? Yes, it is found in normal adults in less than 3.5%. Okay, so the, the, the percentages I just showed you right here, these are the uh, normal percentages of types of hemoglobin in a normal adult or healthy adult, okay? If any of these percentages got lower or higher, that would indicate a, a problem, an issue, or a disease, okay? And we're going to talk about the changes in hemoglobin percentages, and we're going to talk about the diseases that manifest. 
Okay, so before we dig into sickle cell anemia and thalassemia, we have to understand what's the difference between a disease or a trait. And uh, uh, all of you guys have to understand that I'm talking about autosomal recessive inheritance. So when the parent has a disease, they will pass it down to their children. Not all diseases, of course, but some diseases are inheritable. Okay, so when I say that this disease is inherited, that means the parents gave the, the disease to the, to the children. There are two types of inheritance, uh, recessive and dominant. Okay, you're gonna take all of this inshallah in your genetics lecture, uh, genetics uh, course next uh, semester inshallah. So what I'm talking about right here is autosomal recessive inheritance. What does that mean? It means that if the mutation, remember we said chromosomes have two alleles, if the mutation is found on only one allele, the patient will present normal. They will look normal, they will have no symptoms, they will be fine. In order for the disease to manifest in that patient, in order to um, realize that this patient is sick, uh, you have to have the mutation in both alleles, okay? The mutation has to, ha has to happen in both alleles. Then you will find symptoms in the uh, patient. That's when we call the patient diseased. This patient will have the disease. But if this patient has only mutate uh, one mutation in one allele, we will call it, uh, we will call that person a carrier. They would have a trait, a disease trait, not the disease, the whole disease itself, okay? So if both parents, uh, one parent is a carrier and the other parent is also a carrier, uh, for every child they have, you have a 25% chance that uh, this person, uh, this, this baby is going to be diseased. You have a 25% chance that this baby will be healthy and you have a 50% uh, chance that this baby will be um, a carrier or only have a trait. This is is of course all um Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but this is the science talking. So does everyone understand disease and trait? Okay, I really hope so, because this is really important. Uh, you're gonna get you're gonna get the whole idea about diseases and traits and and autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant, you're gonna get all of that in your genetics uh, course. Don't really, don't worry about it right now, just understand the concept behind it and that's it. Okay. So let's start with our first disease for the, for the day. Uh, sickle cell anemia manifests from a mutation in beta globin gene. Uh, beta globin gene was on chromosome 11, if you guys remember. Uh, so the mutation is a replacement of glutamic acid or glutamate by valine at position six. I know sometimes this, this stuff does not make sense and, and it's just a bunch of words at position six. But what's position six? I know it's confusing, but you guys really have to memorize this. This will not only just يعني, appear in your block right now, it will appear in a lot of other blocks. Because sickle cell anemia is really, really common, especially in the Mediterranean area. Um, and you have to memorize the type of mutation that happens in this disease, which is the replacement of glut glutamic acid or glutamate by valine at position six. Okay. Uh, the type of inheritance in sickle cell anemia is, as I just said, autosomal recessive. Okay, and the hemoglobin, the defective hemoglobin that results from this mutation is called hemoglobin S or sickle hemoglobin. And this is a picture of what the sickle cell would look like. If you guys know what a sickle is, uh, in Arabic it's called minjal, or um, in other words, it looks like a crescent or a hilal. Okay. So um, the complications of sickle cell anemia. Uh, include sickle cell crisis and autosplenectomy, okay? So the sickle cell crisis happens as follows. So if the hemoglobin is not produced the way it should be, there is a defect, there is a mutation, the cell would lose its its original shape. And I'm pretty sure you guys already have taken the, uh, the normal shape of a red blood cell, which is biconcave. Uh, this shape of the red blood cell uh, allows it to flow through the vessel smoothly, subhanAllah. So any changes in that shape will cause the sickle cell to change um, its 
how do you say, it? its um, ability to flow through the vessel smoothly. So it would look exactly like this picture. Now imagine your cells, not your cells, subhanAllah, a patient's cells look like that, okay? They will go through the vessel and they will clump together. They were like, they're like hooks. They will find anything to latch on and attach to. Imagine the cells are like this and they will flow through the vessel and they're, at, they're gonna attach to each other. And they're gonna cause clots, like balls of really uh, clumped red blood cells. These clots can travel through uh, big vessels to smaller, to smaller, to smaller until they can't pass through the vessel. This will cause obstruction. So the blood won't be able to flow through the vessel normally. So it won't get to the, tar the target uh, tissue that it's supposed to be supplying. So the target tissue will get less uh, blood flow. That will cause pain in the tissue or the organ that you're trying to supply. So this pain is called a sickle cell crisis. This, um, this sickle cell crisis is not happening all the time. It's in episodes. Okay, and when it happens, we call it sickle cell crisis. It's it's really painful and because like imagine trying to walk and your muscle just starts aching. That hurts. And you know, uh, it's because the muscle itself, like imagine your leg muscle, it's not getting enough supply. Okay, so it can't function normally because every single cell in your body needs oxygen. So autosplenectomy, um, the spleen in childhood gets enlarged. Why? Does anyone know what the spleen does? If you don't, it's okay. I'll, I'll explain it. <laughs> okay. So uh, what the spleen does basically is that it collects or sequesters dead or dying red blood cells. It also sequesters uh, defective red blood cells because we don't, we're not gonna use them. They're bad, they're bad product. So the spleen collects them, breaks them down and we re reuse the breakdown products to make new, re new re uh, red, uh, red blood cells, right? So when the spleen is sequestering defective red blood cell, imagine it's, trying to work in a, in a patient that has sickle cell anemia. The, the patient with that disease will have most of their red blood cells defective. They're not, they're not working properly. So the spleen will be working over time to sequester most of the red blood cells. So it will get enlarged, or it's gonna be called splenomegaly. Spleno refers to the spleen and megaly refers to mega or big, enlarged, okay? That happens in childhood. In adulthood, the splenectomy, not splenectomy, the spleen itself, uh, it's going to get injured. It's going to get really tired. I don't know if you guys know the, the term burnout. It's going to get burnout, okay, because of how much it's working. It's working over time because most of the blood cells are defective. So in adulthood, the spleen is going to be like, that's it. I'm done. I'm out, okay? So actually, instead of getting bigger, it's gonna get smaller, okay? It's gonna shrink and it's gonna have fibrosis. Fibrosis is the formation of scar tissue. So basically your spleen is dead. Scar tissue and it's not working, and it's shrunk. So autosplenectomy means that your body is getting rid of the spleen by itself. Splenectomy by, by its own, not auto, splenectomy is a surgery people do to get their spleen out. Autosplenectomy, that means your body's doing that for the person. Like you don't need to get surgery. Your the body is trying to get of the to get rid of the spleen because basically it's dead tissue right now. Okay. So that's basically it for sickle cell crisis and autosplenectomy, which are the complications of sickle cell anemia. Okay, so if you're suspecting sickle cell anemia in the patient, what investigations will you order? You'll order a, CV, a CBC. The hemoglobin will be 6 to 10%, which is pretty low, anemic. Okay. You'll also order a smear. In the smear, you'll see sickle-shaped uh, sickle cells like this. They're going to be very obvious. Um, anisocytosis. Uh, I don't know if you guys have taken the, these terms yet, but anisocytosis is 
the red blood cells being of different sizes, okay? Uh, target cells, these target cells, it's, it's the easiest type of cell to recognize on a blood smear. It looks like a target, like a circle with a dark circle in the middle. Looks like a target. Um, poikilocytosis, are, uh, it means that uh, RBCs are found of different si uh, different shapes, sorry, okay? So anisocytosis is RBCs of different sizes, and poikilocytosis is RBCs of different uh, shapes. And you see fi uh, fragmented cells and nucleated RBCs. So why would you see nucleated RBCs? Uh, in the process of urethropoiesis, the last step is getting rid of the nucleus and RBCs, then releasing them into the into the blood. So the red blood cells, when they get into the blood, they don't have a nucleus. So finding nucleated RBCs in the blood means one thing. It means that your, your body is sensing that you have a lack or a shortage in blood cells, okay? So it's going to release whatever it has. Whatever we have, just throw it out because the body needs more. So it might secrete uh, immature RBCs, which are the nucleated RBCs. They're not ready. No, they're, they're not fully ready to carry oxygen and do their job. But because we have shortage of RBCs, your body's going to be like, okay, we need more. Even if they're not mature, they're, they're not ready. We don't care. Just throw them out because we need more. Okay. So the last sign you will see uh, in sickle cell anemia smear is Howell Jolly bodies, which are the uh, small blue um, dots they will see in the red blood cells, like the picture on the side, okay? This is a uh, an example of a smear of, of a person with sickle cell anemia. The black uh, arrows are, to, are um, pointing at target cells, and these are the sickle cells, okay? You have to familiarize yourself with the pictures because Dr. Rehan really loves pictures. And he loves the pictures that he adds in the in the slide in his slides. Okay, also focus in lab. Everything is coming in the exam. Okay, so um if you do see sickle cells in the smear, what do you do next? You do the solubility test and hemoglobin electrophoresis or HPLC. So the uh, sickle solubility test. You will add the patient's blood to a tube like this, okay? And uh, you will add um, a reagent, okay? You will mix them together and the hemoglobin S or the sickle hemoglobin is insoluble. So it's going to precipitate and it's going to form a fluid that is not see-through or opaque fluid, okay? This is the positive test. As you can see, you can't see the lines behind the tube. And this is the clear pink negative test. This person does not have sickle cell anemia. So um, this is all about the solubility test. The hemoglobin electrophoresis or um, HPLC, they're tests done to um, assess the types of hemoglobin that you have in your body. This is an example of a person with um, uh, sickle cell anemia. The hemoglobin S, as you can see, is very high, okay? Um, I think that's it for sickle cell anemia. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for sickle cell anemia? Okay. Hope everything is clear. So we'll go into our second disease of the day, thalassemia. Thalassemia, as we said in the beginning of the lecture, is a quantitative decrease in the production of beta or alpha globin chains, okay? So uh, any decrease in the beta chains is called beta thalassemia, and any decrease in the alpha chains is called alpha thalassemia. So the difference between them is that, other than the difference in the chains themselves, but beta thalassemia is a mutation in the beta gene, but the alpha thalassemia is entire complete deletion of the alpha gene. Like the beta thalassemia, the beta gene is there, but it's mutated, it's not normal. But the alpha thalassemia, the alpha gene is not there in the, from the, in the first place, okay? So let's start with alpha thalassemia. The first column you see here is the uh, alpha globin chains of a normal person, four 
genes should be there, okay? Remember when we said chromosome 16 has two alpha genes on each allele? So basically we have, in, yani in total, we have four. If you have all four, that's normal. A silent carrier would be a deletion in one alpha gene, only one, okay? Uh, a minor or uh, an alpha thalassemia trait, it will be a deletion in two alpha genes, whether the, 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 alpha gene, the two alpha genes were on the same allele or on different alleles. This is, this is a deletion on the same allele and this is on different alleles, okay? Hemoglobin H disease is the deletion of three alpha genes. So we only have one alpha gene left. And Bart's hydrops fatalis is the most severe type of alpha thalassemia and it's not even compatible with life, okay? So this is a chart that helps you recognize the difference between alpha thalassemias. The first one is normal. The second one is uh, the silent carrier. And the silent carrier will have normal CBC, normal hemoglobin, normal MCV. They will have normal test results, okay? The uh, one is minor or thalassemia trait. Uh, it's also called thalassemia minor. Uh, these pa patients are asymptomatic, but they will they might have mild microcytic anemia. The hemoglobin H disease is thalassemia intermedia. Okay, um, sometimes they call it thalassemia major because the actual thalassemia major, which is uh, a bidrops fatalis, is not a hydrops fatalis is not even compatible with life. So sometimes they don't even consider it. So uh, thalassemia intermedia, which is uh, hemoglobin H disease. Uh, the patients will have mild to moderate microcytic anemia. Okay, so we're done with alpha thalassemia. Now we'll go into beta thalassemia. The uh, beta thalassemia manifests itself when uh, the baby is uh, in the transition phase. There is a transition phase several months after, uh, after birth where the baby is trying to replace uh, their gamma chains into beta chains. Remember when we said hemoglobin F or fetal hemoglobin, it's found in babies and it has gamma chains instead of beta. So when the baby is like uh, several months uh, old, uh, they start to replace their gamma chains with beta chains. So when the baby is trying to replace their gamma, gamma chains into beta chains and they find that there is no beta chains to start with or there is a mutation in the beta gene and they can't produce uh, beta globin, uh, that's when beta thalassemia signs start to happen, okay? So what happens in beta thalassemia is decreased or absent production of beta chains and an accumulation of alpha uh, chains. So decreased or absent production of beta chains will cause hypochromic microcytic anemia. And the accumulation of alpha chains happens because we don't have beta chain. So the body is trying to compensate for the lack of beta by producing more alpha, although that won't work, but the body doesn't know any what works and what doesn't. First, just trying its best to save, well, the baby right now. Okay, so accumulation of alpha chains will cause hemolysis of RBC precursors in the bone marrow, leading to erythropoiesis, okay? So uh, as I explained before, autosomal recessive inheritance in sickle cell anemia is the same as inheritance in beta thalassemia. It's also autosomal recessive. So let's just review it again. If both patients are carriers, uh, with each baby that they have, they have a 25% chance that this baby will be normal. They have a 25% chance that this baby will have thalassemia. Uh, and they have a 50% chance that their, uh, their baby is going to be a carrier. Okay, so we have two types of beta thalassemia. We have BO or B0, and we have B+. B0 or BO is a complete absence of beta chain production, okay? And B+, is a partial block in beta chain production. So remember in the genes, we had two alleles, and on each allele, we have one beta gene. So if we have both beta genes mutated, you have uh, uh, beta 0 or beta O. If you have only one gene, you have beta plus, okay? So this is a, an example of a beta thalassemia patient. Um, 
and you will find on the blood smear anisocytosis, poikilocytosis, and nucleated RBCs. We explained all of these before, and sometimes you'll find target cells too. Okay, is everything understood with thalassemias, alpha and beta? Okay. Okay, so, um, oops, sorry. So we'll start with hemoglobin electrophoresis. Hemoglobin electrophoresis is a test that is done uh, with alkaline or acid gel conditions, okay? And it is done to uh, estimate, it's not very accurate, but estimate the, um, uh, the types of hemoglobin this person has or this patient has. So the con for hemoglobin electrophoresis is that if the person has really low concentration of a type of hemoglobin or a hemoglobin variant, uh, this test will be slow and inaccurate. It might not even detect it if you have really low concentrations. Okay, that's the only con about this, uh, this, uh, about this test. Okay, so this, an ex this is an example of a hemoglobin electrophoresis done for a patient. So you have to know how to interpret this picture because this picture will be brought in the exam. Examples of it will be brought in the exam. So A stands for hemoglobin A, which is the uh, majority or in the major type of hemoglobin you would have in your body in, in a normal healthy adult. F is hemoglobin F, hemoglobin S, and hemoglobin C. Uh, column number one is the control, okay? Column number two is the normal person. Most of their hemoglobin is hemoglobin A. Uh, number three, you have almost 50-50, almost at half-half, hemoglobin A and hemoglobin F. This is probably a child, okay? So it's normal in children. Uh, number four, this person most of their hemoglobin is hemoglobin S. That means they have sickle cell anemia or disease, not trait, disease, because most of their hemoglobin is S. Uh, number six, you have, again, also almost half, half, almost, uh, hemoglobin A and hemoglobin S. This person has sickle cell trait, okay? Um, number seven, you have, this, this person has hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C. Okay, this is another type of sickle cell. It's called sickle cell C, but the doctor didn't mention it, so I'm not going to go into it. And number eight is the same as number six. This person has a uh, sickle cell trait, okay? Because it's also, again, 50-50, hemoglobin A and hemoglobin S. You, all, you guys have, really have to uh, memor uh, uh, memorize how to interpret this picture because this picture is really important. You have to understand how to uh, interpret uh, electrophoresis test. Okay, so uh, NUR 1 is control, okay? This is what you can compare to. As you can see, all columns are colored. You compare everything else to number one because that's the control. And number seven is, um, it's a, a type of disease that the doctor did not mention. So um, don't go into it that deep. So the person has hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C, okay? So um, this is called sickle cell C. If you want, you can read about it, but don't go too deep into it, okay? Okay, so I want you guys to help me with this one. Um, the red column right here is the control, okay? slash normal person, control slash normal person. You compare everything else to the red column. So what do you think is column number two right here? Okay, I said, yeah, you guys are right, sickle trait, because um, A and S are both found here, okay? Um, number three, Yes, you're right. It's sickle cell disease because most of the hemoglobin is S. 
Okay. This is the disease I told you not to worry about. Um, what about here? This column right here. The one before the last one. Yes, it's normal. That was trick, but yeah. So let me just show you. I'll remove the... Remove the block that I have. Covers the answers. This is thalassemia minor. I don't want to get into it too much, but I'll show you like um, a chart Dr. Raihan had for you guys. I don't want to get I don't want to get too deep into it, but any I think you have to you have to know this. You have to differentiate between minor and major. Sickle C sickle C is the disease I told you not to worry about. Uh, sickle trait, sickle disease, and this is the normal one. Okay. Okay, so HPLC is the uh, other test that we do to um wait. Aya says, isn't thalassemia major normal in infants? It wouldn't be thalassemia major. It would just be normal because infants have high concentrations of uh, hemoglobin F. Okay, so it, it would be just normal. They won't have thalassemia major. We, it's not a disease. It's only a disease when the, the, when the baby is supposed to change from hemoglobin F to hemoglobin S, uh, hemoglobin uh, A, sorry. Okay, so... When the, the baby is trying to change from this to that and they can't, that's when we try to uh, diagnose it as thalassemia. Okay, so uh, HPLC is a another test that we do to calculate or estimate the uh, uh, the types of hemoglobin in a person's body. So this is an example of a normal uh, uh, HPLC test. A is 96.8%. It's pretty high. Should be the majority of the hemoglobin types you have. Uh, hemoglobin F is less than one. Remember I told you it's one or less. And hemoglobin A2 should be less than 3.5. So if these are the normal, what are the abnormal? Okay, you have to memorize the normal before you can recognize the abnormal tests. This is a chart that's found in uh, Dr. Rehan's lecture. This is the normal uh, uh, hemoglobin. You have mostly hemoglobin A and hemoglobin A2, uh, 2 or less, or less than 3.5. So beta thalassemia trait, the key difference is that you have high hemoglobin A2. Okay. I want you to notice the hemoglobin A2 and the hemoglobin F. So hemoglobin F is still pretty low. Okay. Hemoglobin A2 is above 3.5. Percent. If it's above 3.5, beta thalassemia trait. The difference between beta thalassemia trait and beta thalassemia major or disease, hemoglobin F is way too high. Hemoglobin F is 95%. Okay, so you can differentiate between these two and the key dif differential between the trait and major. Trait, you have high uh, hemoglobin A2 above 3.5 and hemoglobin F, you have 95% which is way too much for an adult, okay? Uh, also, how to differentiate between sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease. Uh, these are the easiest ones. Uh, if the hemoglobin S is less than 50, okay, they have trait. If it's more than 50, they have a disease, okay? That's as simple as it gets. So it's easy to differentiate between between sickle cell trait and disease, but it's it's a little bit tricky with trait uh, with beta thalassemia trait and beta thalassemia major. So you guys really have to familiarize yourself with the percentages. You have to memorize them. Okay, so I want you guys to help me with this one. Uh, hemoglobin A is fifty seven percent. Hemoglobin F is less than one, and hemoglobin S is thirty eight point four percent. What do you guys think is the diagnosis? Okay, you guys are right. Yes, it's sickle cell trait. Why? Because the hemoglobin S is less than 50%. Okay, so this is another test. Hemoglobin A is non-existent. Hemoglobin F is above 
90%. Hemoglobin A2 is 5.8. What do you guys think? Yes, it's thalassemia major. Uh, Jose said it's an infant. It could be, but these tests are usually done for adults. Okay, HPLC and uh, they, they, in the question, they will probably give you the age. So most likely they will give you the age. So yeah. Okay, so here is a question for you guys. You're treating a patient who presents with microcytic anemia. Additional microscopic findings demonstrate the presence of inclusion bodies in the red blood cells. Electrophoresis of urethrocyte protein extracts show a large excess of beta globins and a near complete lack of alpha globins. Okay, I highlighted near because this gives you the answer. Which of the following disorders most closely correlates to your findings? Hemoglobin H disease, hereditary uh, present, uh, persistence of fetal hemoglobin, hydrops vitalis, sickle cell anemia, and beta thalassemia major. What do you guys think? Okay, we have a lot of mixed answers. So, near complete lack of alpha globins. Okay, alpha globins. So can it be beta thalassemia? No, right? The problem is not with, with, with beta, it's with alpha. So try to eliminate anything uh, that is not related to alpha thalassemia. So beta thalassemia is gone, sickle cell anemia is gone. Um, B also is gone. Because that's based on thalassemia. Yes. No, I got it right. It's hemoglobin H disease. Near complete lack. Complete lack means they have no alpha genes. Okay. Near complete, that, that means they have one. Near complete. It's really like they have the least you can have. You can't have non, no, uh, no alpha genes. Because, well, it's not compatible with life. Okay, so the answer here is hemoglobin H disease. They're, they're going to trick you with the words. So expect a lot of questions like that. So a 35, um, a 35 year old, uh, apparently healthy man undergoes a medical examination while applying for life insurance. He's not anemic. His hemoglobin is uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis is reported as hemoglobin A1 is 62%. HBS or hemoglobin S is 35%, hemoglobin F is 1%, hemoglobin A2 is 1%, no variant C, D, G, or H bands are detect detected. Which of the following can be the diagnosis? I highlighted your answer. Hemoglobin S is 35%. Yes, whoever answered C, you guys are correct. It's sickle cell trait. Why? Because the hemoglobin S is less than 50%. Inshallah, you guys are pro. Okay? So, um, going back to Noor, um, remember I said uh, one type of uh, alpha thalassemia is hemoglobin H. Let's go back to the slide. Here, hemoglobin H disease is a near complete lack of alpha globins. Okay, you have three genes, three alpha genes disappearing or not being here, and also only one uh, alpha gene is there. That's hemoglobin H disease. Is that clear? Okay. Okay, so we are coming to an end to this lecture. Does anyone have any questions? Chris, you guys are welcome. Okay, so here is my number and my email. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, and yeah, good luck, guys. So Maya says she didn't understand the last question. Okay, let's just go back to the last question. Okay, 
So a 35-year-old, okay, 35-year-old, uh, he uh, experiences a hemoglobin or it's a hemoglobin electrophoresis is done for him, okay? These are the results. Hemoglobin A1 or hemoglobin A, the normal hemoglobin that should be the majority of his hemoglobin is 62. That means it's low, right? I highlighted this for you because this will give you the answer. Hemoglobin S is 35%, okay? Let's go back to the chart right here. So hemoglobin S right here, if it's less than 50%, that indicates what? Sickle cell trait. So in the question, how many or how much how much uh, hemoglobin S did he have? 35%. Yani in the normal adult, it should not exist. Hemoglobin S should not be in the, uh, in the hemoglobin electrophoresis. It should not be a result. But this person has it, and it's less than 50%. So it's a sickle trait, okay? You guys ha really have to memorize the percentages because it really helps you to uh, solve questions faster. You don't have to waste much time on the question if you memorize the percentage. So is that clear? Okay. Uh, I just asked, can it be hemoglobin S, uh, like 1%, it will be sickle cell trait. I'm not really sure, but I'm pretty sure that uh, they won't get you really uh, borderline questions that you don't know if it's straight, or if it's normal. They won't get you questions like 1%. Okay, it's, it's going to be really obvious that it's a trait or really obvious that it's a disease. It's not going to be something in between, something that you don't know. It's, it's going to be really clear. Okay, so I'm not sure if it's one percent. We could call it a trait. I'm not really sure. Let's uh, focus on the on the big picture, especially in first year. Okay, guys. Okay. Okay. I really hope I helped anyone today. Inshallah. And thank you guys for attending.